Father God, we pray that you would still the voices that surround us. We pray that you would speak to our hearts in these moments. We don't need to hear what our world says. We need to hear what you say. We don't need to sense the heart, the heartbeat of our culture. We need to sense your heartbeat. We don't need any other stillness than the stillness that you bring. We don't need any other truth other than the truth that you bring. You alone bring wholeness to us. You alone bring peace to us. You alone bring hope to us. You alone bring healing. And so, Father, we pray this morning here in this place and wherever people may be at and hearing of, your, of you today, we pray, Father, that your presence would settle among us. Not just so that we would feel better, but so that we would be restored. We don't need a Band-Aid this morning, Father. We need the spirit of your presence speaking deep into our hearts. And so we ask you, Father, to be our Father today. Mm -hmm. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I don't know about you, but I love camping. Anybody else here love camping? Raise your hand high if you're proud. Be proud of it. Anybody here love campfires? I love campfires. I learned this weekend the difference between a campfire and a bonfire is just the amount of wood that you put on that thing. I love hiking. Anybody else here love hiking? Today we're going to hear about the people of Israel. We're going to hear about quite a hike that they went on. We're going to hear about quite a camping event. We're going to hear about a camping event and a hike that they went on that took 40 years. I don't know about you, I love camping. I love campfires. I love hiking. I also love, in, I love coming back home. Amen? For the people of Israel, that wasn't an option. They were on this journey with God. And we're going to intersect their journey and hear what they, what they were experiencing. But we have to know, because by the, by the number of the census that we see in Numbers chapter 1, it's very, very likely that there were over a million people on this camp out. I don't know about you, but for me personally, when I go on a camp out, I don't really want to be around a million people. I want to have some space. I want to have, I want to see the sky. I want there to be clarity. And it wasn't like going on a camp out to the Pigeon River or up to a Boy Scout camp. This was 40 years camping in the wilderness, most of it desert. Their experience was chaos. They had already been in a form of transition, and the world that they knew back in Egypt had been totally upended. Was it really just a few short weeks ago that God took us out of that place? They must have asked of each other. Everything had dramatically changed. In fact, later in the book of Numbers, they even complained to God that the pickles were better in Egypt. When would they arrive? What would they arrive to and would it ever feel like home? You see, they needed a calming of their clamoring. So the people of Israel, when we find them on this journey with God, in the Old Testament, book of Numbers, which is the fourth book in the Old Testament, the people of Israel are right in the middle of their exodus. Egypt was way back there. The Red Sea, no longer visible. They're on this journey with God. And God is palpably evident. I don't know if you remember this or not, but God made his presence known by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And then God settled his presence on the tent of meeting, which was basically a mobile tabernacle. God settled his presence on there and they could see it visible with a cloud. But their environment, in the middle of this very cool very epic stuff that's going on. Their environment is chaotic. Can you imagine a million people with their livestock trying to move anywhere on foot in any way that made any sense at all? Their experience, their environment was chaotic. 
And as I was thinking about that over these last couple of weeks, I, I thought about our tendency as human beings because we want there to be order in the context of chaos, right? We seek order to give us health and stability and understanding. In fact, if this year, if the year of 2020 hasn't taught us or hasn't reminded us that we seek order to provide us a sense of stability and a sense of health and, a, and an awareness and a sense of understanding, if we haven't figured that out this year, then we haven't been very observant. The people of Israel were experiencing chaos. And so God, God knew their journey, right? God was right there in the context. He's right there in the mix of their journey. And he knows the human tendency. And so God began to provide them with very clear directions beyond this surreal movement of nature. God gave them very clear directions. And so I, I invite you to turn with me, if you would, to your device or your Bible, to the book of Numbers in the Old Testament, fourth book in the Bible, the book of Numbers in the Old Testament. Today we're going to look very briefly at chapter 1. We're just going to do a touch and go on chapter 1. And then we're going to stay just a little bit longer. We're going to do a, a shorter, a, a little bit longer landing on chapter 2. And then we're, then we're going to jump over to chapter 6 and we're really going to land there for a little while. I just want you to understand, God is giving them very specific guidelines. In fact, if you're not a detail person, you may look at some of this and say, man, that's just, that's just over the top the specific instructions that God is giving them. But God is giving them this in order to give them order and stability. You've probably heard me say those words at least three or four times by now. Understand that God is creating for them in this chaos an environment created by God of order and stability. In essence, he's putting the sides on the sandbox. In the context of chaos, God is giving them stability. And I want to remind you this morning that God always does that. If we give God a chance in the context of chaos, God will always create and provide stability. But in the numbers now, chapter 1, we see, and we're just going to touch on this, we see God determine that it's time to take a census. And so he directs them, this is how you're going to do this census. And they take this, they do this numbering of all of the people, of all of the tribes, the census is not for God. God already knows who's there. He knows them by name. He knows how many people are there. The census is not for God. It's not for his knowledge or his understanding. It's for theirs. It's to provide them with a sense of context to say, oh, so this is how many people we've got. What are we going to do with all of these people? How are we going to organize all these people? And then we turn to chapter 2 and we get a better sense of this emerging pattern between God and and the Israelites. So this is what it says, chapter 2, verse 1. Take a look with me at this. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, the Israelites are to camp around the tent of meeting some distance from it, each of them under their standard and holding the banners of their family. You see, God is providing these very clear instructions for them. And he goes on through chapter 2 to give them this crystal clear guideline on which tribes were to camp together and which direction from the tent and meeting they were, were to be in. So picture this now. The tent of meeting is this mobile tabernacle. And this is the place where God dwells. In, in this context, it's actually this physical place where God is dwelling. And God says, I will have my place among the Israelites and they will be my people, and I will be their God. And so he creates this place. It's called the Tent of Meetings. It's a mobile tabernacle. And God says, don't get too close, but around the Tent of Meeting, I want the, I want the tribes to gather. And so all these tribes, he basically set them up, three tribes in each camp. These three tribes will be in the camp to the east, and these tri three tribes to the camp to the north, and these three tribes to the camp to the west. And these three tribes in the camp to the south. And he said, this is where you'll be placed. And I want you to know that you're going to be near me. See, this is the context that God is creating. He's not just throwing them out there and saying, figure it out, kids. He's saying, no, 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 I've got a place for you. And the place for you is near me. I've got a place where I'm going to be. And the place where I'm going to be is near you. 
And so this is where you will camp, and this is how you will go out. So every time where God said, it's time to move on, they even knew how they were supposed to depart, which tribes were supposed to go first, and which tribes came after that, and where the tent of the meeting was in the process of the journey. So God is giving them these very detailed instructions to give them order and clarity. And, and here's why. God wanted to neutralize the chaos. He wanted to give order. He wanted to establish a way for this to happen. He wanted to neutralize the chaos. And so just kind of an off-the-cuff off question that I have for you is, is there any chaos in your life that God might want to neutralize? What's the place of chaos? What does it look like? What does it feel like? Can God do anything about it? And now take a look at this, because we're still pursuing this. See, these, these guidelines and instructions are there to settle them, to give them clarity, to neutralize the chaos. But then, but then God's presence is there to give them peace. So take a look at this, because this helps us to understand a continuation of the, the, the theory of what's going on here. Verse 34, verse 34 of Numbers chapter 2 says this. So the Israelites, and this is good, this is good. So the Israelites did everything the Lord commanded Moses. That is the way they encamped under their standards, and that is the way they set out, each of them with their clan and family. So we see this pattern early on, and it continues in the book of Numbers. The pattern is this. God has a word, and it's there for a purpose, and the Israelites obey. It's pretty simple, isn't it? A and B. God has a word, it gives clear guidance and neutralizes the chaos, and their obedience creates this relational harmony between them and God. And then this pattern in the book of Numbers, then it just kind of begins to develop. It just keeps growing like a cumulus cloud in the summer, just growing and expanding. Because we see this, it gets very, very specific, even to specific groups of people. There are discussions about diseased people being sent outside of the camp. There are discussions about guidance for making restitution for wrongs. There's even a very specific set of guidelines given to people who had taken a vow of separation to the Lord, called, by the way, Nazarites. Not Nazarenes, but Nazarites. You see, it gets very, very detailed. But check this out, because right in the middle of all of these very specific instructions, in Numbers chapter 6, something absolutely remarkable happens. And I hope this just kind of speaks to your heart like it's done for mine. Because right between a Nazarite shaving his head and a discussion a little bit later about the taking of the offering, something fantastic happens, and it should take your breath away. I liken this to an experience that I shared with, with a friend recently. It was about a time in Papua New Guinea. I was, I was uh, snorkeling with a friend of mine in the Coral Sea off the north coast of Papua New Guinea, and we were just tooling along. His name is Jim Ratcliffe. We were just kind of tooling along. We had flippers on. We were just mostly just using our hands. We were just kind of tooling along in about two meters of water. It's about two meters down, a little, little deeper than from here to the, to the floor there, about two meters down to the coral. And it was so beautiful. It was, there was greens and turquoise blues and all kinds of oranges, and I saw clownfish and coralfish and just angelfish and all kinds of things, damselfish, all kinds of stuff going on. And there are all these colors, and there's so much detail, and it's so, so vivid, and it's all right there. And then all of a sudden, whew, it just dropped out. I mean, the, the coral ridge that was two meters below the water just dropped out into this dark blue abyss. So don't tell anybody about this, but I'll just tell you, okay? It scared me. I mean, it took my breath away. I was just like, I had a snorkel tube on, I was just <gasps> like that. This is like all this beautiful color and all this definition, and I felt somewhat secure. Maybe wrongly so, but I felt secure. And then all of a sudden, whew, dark, blue, can't see the bottom at all. And so Jim Radcliffe and I both took our hands to get back up over the coral because we just didn't know what was there. I mean, I'd experienced sharks before, up close and personal. And the unknown is sometimes a really daunting thing. Why am I telling you that story? Because this passage, what happens here, it's just kind of like, here are all these details, and here are all these colors, and here's what it looks like, and all of a sudden, boom, 
And God says this in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22. Here's how it sets up. And God said to Moses, tell Aaron and his sons, this is how you are to bless the Israelites. Say this to them. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. You see, it's all about God near and God turning and God seeing and God shining and God blessing and God giving grace. It's so different, isn't it? It's so different than, and this is when a Nazarite will shave his head. It's so different than, this is how you take the offering. Because all of a sudden, it's God looking and God seeing and God blessing and God giving mercy and God changing unbelievable I want you to notice with me that there is a there is actually a significant context that we could easily miss when we look at this passage the context is obedience you see in Numbers 154 it basically says and they obeyed and in Numbers 234 it says basically and they obeyed in Numbers 3.42, it says, they obeyed. In Numbers 3.51, it says, they obeyed. In Numbers 4.49, it says, they obeyed. In Numbers 5.4, it says, they obeyed. There are these examples of this climate, this culture of obedience between God and the Israelites. And when God says, this is what you're going to do, they say, okay, we'll do it. Okay, now Israelites, I want you to do this. Yep, okay, we got it. Israelites, now I want you to do this. Got it, we'll do that. There's this context. There is this culture of obedience. And see, as I was looking at this, because this number six passage is just wedged between these batches of detailed instructions. You see, it's, what's remarkable to me is that there's no if-then statement. I mean, we see these scriptures, right, where God says, if my people or if my children, dot, 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 then I will. We see that. We see that in scripture. But it's not here. And when I looked at it, I thought, wow, crazy. Why did God not put that there? Why did God not say, if, dot, 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 then? You know why? Because he was living with them in a culture of obedience. God didn't have to say, if you'll do these things, then this, because it, they were living with him in obedience. If God said, I want you to do this, they did it. So in today's context, it would be like God saying to Pastor Ryan, Pastor Ryan, I want you to do this, and Ryan says, how soon do you want it done? Or God's saying to Keith Barnes, Keith Barnes, I want you to do this. And Keith says, yep, I'm on it. Or God's saying to Karen, Karen, I want you to do this. And Karen says, how soon? Or God's saying to any one of us here today, here's what I want you to do. And, you, and it's not like, well, you know, God, I can't speak that well or I'm too old or whatever, right? God, yeah, I'm in. So see, God didn't have to create an if-then statement to this promise that he gave them because there was a culture of obedience. There's another thing that I noticed about this passage, and this is pretty exciting to me. Th there was no A-plus performance that happened just before this. There was no great, oh my goodness, where God says, can you believe, and he turns to the angel, can you believe that they just did that? There's nothing of that reflected. It's just God giving all of these detailed instructions. And you know what that spoke to my heart? Because this isn't like Peter in the New Testament saying of Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, and Jesus says, who, dude, seriously? I mean, okay, so the scripture doesn't really quite say it that way, but it's pretty close. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Whoa. There is no A-plus performance here. It's just a context of obedience. And I was struggling with that a little bit, quite honestly, because I was like, God, you know what? You know, if, if, this, if this had an if-then statement, then i get it. It'd be a simple sermon. Or if this was, whoa, they did that, so I'm going to do this, be a simple sermon. There was no A-plus performance. There was no if-then statement. And what that said to my heart as I leaned into this is that there is a weightiness of our obedience. So when God speaks and we obey, that speaks to his heart. Wow. It speaks to his heart. 
And so we've got this context here where God says, I want to bless my children. But the crazy thing is there's no run-up, right? It's just detailed instructions, and after this, there's going to be de- It's almost like it's out of place. One moment you're in the shallow waters of these detailed instructions, it's clearly defined. It's understandable. And the next moment you are hanging over the deep, dark blue. But it's not the deep, dark blue of potential danger or the deep, dark blue that creates fear. It's the deep, dark blue of God looking back at you, of God saying, Nate, I see you. It's of God saying, Vicki, I know you. You're my daughter. It's of God saying, Julie, I love you. It's of God saying that to them. And it's of God saying that to us. Can you just pause in that for just a moment? Because God actually wants to speak that to your heart today. This wasn't just for them centuries or millennia ago. This is God's word for you today. God wants you to know that he sees you. He understands the chaos. He understands even why you try and fill in some gaps. He knows you. He chooses to dwell with you. He chooses to be the sanctuary among you. He chooses to speak into your heart and say, I see you, I know you, I love you, you're my son, you're my daughter. He chooses to do that. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Huh. I've known a lot of grace, but I've, there's nothing that compares to the grace of God. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Oh, I don't know about you. There's a lot of places when I look around, I'm like, oh God, we could use some peace over there, and we could use some peace over there, and we could use some peace over there. There's nothing like the peace that God provides. So is this not what we long for deep within? And sometimes we even struggle to define it or understand it. And so in our definite, in our finite, rather, under, understanding, because we have this limited scope and perspective, even that of our culture, as we set out to define a blessing from God, we can compose this definition of what we think this looks like. So what does it look like when God's face is shining on me? What does it look like when God is turned toward me? What does it look like when God is giving grace and peace? And if we're, we are so tempted to create this composition that is largely circumstantial, right? Because it's what we know. We, we're tempted to create this composite that is driven by cultural values. Because honestly, everything that we find abstract, we seek to define. The deep blue depths, no thanks. I'll get back over to the coral. Down there, I don't even know what's there. No thanks. Give me what I know. And amazingly, God lets us go there. Because remember, he understands us. He knows how we are wired. He knows that our tendency is where there is ambiguity, where it's abstract, we seek to define and he lets us go there. He doesn't even chastise us when we go to circumstantial things like health or when we talk about lack of conflict or when we talk about just if everybody could just get along, it'd be, it must feel like God's blessing. Or when we talk about, do you remember when a politician years ago said his political promise was a chicken in every pot? And we look at those things and we say, I got, enough, I got enough wood for the winter. I'm good. Is that a blessing of the Lord? It could be. But I believe the blessing of the Lord can actually go much deeper and go much broader than that. It can be about children for loving parents and loving parents for each child. But these things all reflect the hope of God for each of us. But the hope of God for you and for me, it's more than just lack of conflict. It's even broader than just, I want to feel better. I don't want to have as much pain. I want to have health. 
It's, it's more important, believe it or not, than your portfolio. Because the hope and the grace and the peace of God, God's power on your life, God's redemption on your life, God's purpose for your life is that you would be restored. You see, redemption is so critical, but God just doesn't, doesn't just want you better. He doesn't want, just want your circumstances to feel better. He envisions you restored. So here's the way I see it, because the psalmist tells us that God, God knew us when we were bit, being knit together in our mother's womb. Here's the way I look at it. God has a dream, and he has a very, a very beautiful dream for each of us. And if it, doesn't, if it doesn't go that way because we take the wrong path, or we, we should have gone that way, we, take, we go that way, God doesn't look at it and say, ah, just, you really messed up. God looks at it and he says, okay, so how can, how can I restore that? How can I make that right? You know, it's been amazing to me in a variety of cultures to see God do this. God is not restricted by culture. He's not restricted by age. He's not restricted by ability. He's not restricted by intelligence. God is only restricted, hear me say this, by our obedience. Same for the Israelites. The context was obedience. The purpose of the blessing is restoration. You see, blessed, restored creation comes into what it was meant, what it was designed to be. Blessed, restored creation reflects and it speaks to and it speaks about the one who restores, the one who blesses, the good, good, so good, amazingly good. I would just keep going on and on if I could. The so good father. We see these blessings in the Bible and they're given at significant times like birth and death and marriage and when children are about to make their own way. And even in our own contemporary culture, we, we have these forms of blessings, right? I mean, we've heard them pronounced recently over our entire nation. God bless the United States of America. Somebody sneezes, and what do we say? Bless you, or maybe God bless you, right? We have these blessings. We even speak a blessing when we have a meal together. We pray together and ask God to bless the food. At least that's how we do it. When we say grace, it's a form, it's a cultural form of blessing, and in some way, they do, these things do reflect an understanding of dependence upon God. But you see, I think the blessing of God goes far beyond God bless my football team, or God bless and make my yard more green, or God help my portfolio to recover. I think the blessing of God, quite honestly, goes far beyond this, because it is God who wants to bless. And as I was looking at this, I was realizing, you know, we, we call it a couple of different things. We call it the ironic blessing because God said for Aaron to speak it, Aaron and his sons. We call it the priestly blessing, but in reality, you know who it's from, right? It's from God. These are God's words. This is not just somebody creating this. These are God's words. And these God words are reflecting God's heart. And these are God's words to you how God sees you, what God wants to do in your journey. As I was thinking about this, I realized, that, you know, way back there at the start, what God created was peace. The Hebrew people call it shalom. It was life whole. What evil caused was brokenness. It was, it was shalom destroyed or disrupted. It was life broken. But God, his heart is still the same. His dream is still the same. His plan is still the same. And it is peace. That is, he wants shalom restored. He wants life made whole again. See, God has a dream. It's all about restoration. And God takes it, and he makes it amazingly personal. So like where you're at right now, not just where you're seated, but where you're at right now in your journey and the things that you're wondering about and the things that you're thinking about, God is right there with you. And he wants to speak his blessing into that place. So God gave this order to the Israelites. 
and the order was meant to establish, to stabilize the chaos. And, it, and his direction brings order into not just their chaos, but he stabilizes our chaos. But God did something so much more for the Israelites. He went far beyond that, and he does that for us as well. He did something much more than simply stabilizing the chaos. He wants to do more than just counteract. He wants to do more than just neutralize your chaos. He wants to restore you. He wants to bring you right back to what he envisioned you to be. As I was thinking about this, for whatever reason, I, I was thinking about an ice cream Sunday, okay? And I was thinking, well, maybe restoration is like the cherry on the top of the Sunday. And then I said, no, 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 that's not right. Restoration is the whole Sunday. Restoration is like the ice cream and the whipped cream and the nuts and the cherry on top. The other part that God did, the first part that he does, the order that God creates, it's just a bowl to hold the blessing. It's just the bowl to hold the restoration. You see, God's vision for you, his dream for you, is restoration. He wants you to be amazingly restored. His face turned toward you. His face shining on you. His face blessing his grace on you. This is my prayer for you. Much more importantly than that, this is God's dream for you. His blessing, his blessing comes from his hand. It comes from his goodness. It comes from his glance. It comes from his gaze. My youngest daughter, Sarah, was just recently back in Fort Wayne for a weekend. We had, we had a great time. I mean, we cooked out, we ate on the deck, we went hiking, we told stories, we caught up. It was so much fun. She was packing up that Sunday afternoon to head back to Indianapolis and I was getting ready for another event that night, and so I was already starting to shift. You ever done that? When your kids are still around, I was already starting to shift. And all of a sudden, there was something that happened in this father's heart. And so I, I ran to the garage door. The garage door was still up, and Sarah was still there in the driveway, getting ready to go. And so I ran out to, the, uh, to her car. I opened the passenger door. I reached over to the empty passenger seat, And I took her face in my hands. And I said, I love you. I wish I had a picture of that face looking back. She has these beautiful blue eyes. And her eyes just danced. I mean, they literally danced. And she looked back at me and she said, oh, Dad, I love you too. And as I walked back into the house, this earthly father's heart <laughs> was reminded of a heavenly father's heart who does so much better than I do. I'm very sure my performance is not A+. Plus. But I thought, I thought of a heavenly father's heart who just so often <laughs> wants to say, I love you. I mean, you see, his gaze is not just, oh, yeah, I see you. No, no, no. He's looking deep in. And what he sees, he loves. I mean, and it's not just this circumstantial love. Remember their performance in the context of their blessing. Their performance is not A+. Plus. They were just obeying. God, you said you want, okay, we'll do that. You want us to do that? Okay, we'll do that. Their performance was not just A+, plus, but it touched the Father's heart. And I can't see anything, my friends, honestly, in this passage this, where God said, oh, man, I, I got to do this for them because, whoa, they just kind of blew my mind away. There's nothing like that. If it wasn't incredibly awkward, 
I would go around to each of you. Like I said, it'd be incredibly awkward. And I'd hold your face in my hands. And I would speak a word of God into your heart. But I would hope it wouldn't just come from this earthly father's heart to your heart. But I would hope that it would come somehow from a heavenly father who just sees you. And he doesn't see the broken. And he doesn't see the messed up. He doesn't see, well, I, I went that way and I should have gone that way. He doesn't see that. He says, you know what? I can restore that. I can't do that. But I know a good, good father who, who really can. You see, it's so easy to create these circumstantial perspectives of what the blessing of God must look like. It must look like this or that or I'm pretty sure. And God says, yeah, I, I get it. I understand that you, you look at things that are confusing and ambiguous, and, so you, and you want to you wanna put something there to fill it in. And I'm also pretty sure that he says, but my child, what I want you to know, what I want you to know is that I love you. I love you. I love you. That's what your father wants you to hear. And he's not saying that because you got it all figured out or because performance is A+. plus. He's saying that because you are his redeemed child who he wants to keep restoring. And he wants to keep blessing. You know something I never saw in this? God never said to Aaron and Moses, he never said, yeah, this is a one and done deal. He never said, do this in this environment or on this certain occasion or when this event happens, do this. It seems pretty open-ended to me. And that open-endedness to me reflects an overwhelming, unbounded, amazingly beautiful love from your Heavenly Father. So you might be sensing some great or even marginal chaos this morning. It might be under the surface, but it's there. There's a lot of chaos, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of uncertainty in these days, and God's order would stabilize that chaos, right? And that would be huge. But I really don't want you to just to just stop there, right? Because the neutralizing or the ordering of your chaos, it's just part of it. God wants to do so much more. God wants to do this transforming. He wants to do more than stabilizing. He wants, his, he wants to take his presence into the broken places and restore. Actually restore. So maybe this morning as you're hearing these words. It could be that you even got some things that are going on. You, like, dude, you don't even know how my hope has been broken. You don't even, you don't even know the broken relationships in my life. Maybe some of you would even say, you know what? My heart is actually wounded. Or maybe you would say, it sounds good, but my walk with him is just. And right in those places, that's where God wants to restore. You see, the Lord, the Lord is all about blessing and keeping his grace and peace restoring so I've got three questions for you and the praise team is going to take us into a time where we hear this song of blessing but I've got three questions for you and they're pretty straightforward first is this what is God saying 
I'm not asking you what, what did God say 20 years ago or even 20 months ago or 20 weeks ago or 20 days ago. What is God saying to you right now? What is God's word to you now? And the second is this, how is your response level? Remember that whole context? The reason God didn't have to say if then is because the context was there. The obedience of the Israelites was, it was a given. How's your response level? And the third is this, what broken place would God want to mend? What place would God want to restore? I want you to hear this one more time before you hear it in song form. Just listen, listen to this, the Lord's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Let's listen together. Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and your children and their children. May His favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and their children and their children. for you. 
I want to invite you to stand this morning. I realize that some people are here by yourselves and what I'm going to do next, I don't want that to feel awkward at all to you. Um, Because the reality is you're not here by yourself. Your Heavenly Father is right there with you. And for those of you that you're in family groups, I'm glad you are. But your family is not the presence of God. They are part of God's blessing. And so I want to invite you just as families, I know, I know. But I want to invite you as families, as much as you want to huddle up, I want to invite you to do that. You see, the Lord, the Lord chose to dwell among them. He tabernacled with them. It's not just a building at a campground. (laughs) And he chooses to tabernacle with you right here, right now. And when you leave this place, he will be with you. And when you go into your week, he will be with you. And when you try and figure out something in the future, he, he will be with you. And when there's turmoil, he will be with you. And when there's anxiety, he will be with you. See, that's how God rolls. But I want you to hear this blessing. And if you want to, however you want to cluster up as a couple or as a family, or like I said, if you're a single, God is right there with you. But I, I don't want you to just couple up or group up as a family. I want you to group up as the children of God assembled with the holy God who is looking at you, who sees you, whose choice is to bless you and to be gracious to you. Can we do that together, Pastor Edgar? May his favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family, and your children, and your children, and their children. May His favor be upon you in a thousand generations. And your family, and your children, and your children, and your children. May His presence go before you, and behind you, and beside you. Let's pray together. Father, we ask you this morning as your children to bring restoration. There is nowhere else we will find that. 
I ask you, Father, for your children who are assembled here in this place, who are scattered around your land. I pray, Father, that your blessing would be upon them. I pray that we would know the reality of your face shining on us. Your goodness overwhelming us. Your mercy restoring broken places. Father, thank you for Thank you for tabernacling with us. Continue to draw us into you. For you. <sighs> you are a good, good father. Amen. Hasn't it been wonderful worshiping together this morning? I want to take this time to ask you to let us know if you've been worshiping with us through online or in person. We have welcome cards in the pockets of the seats in front of you. Take a minute and fill those out and let us know how we can pray for you and how we can celebrate with you. And also we want to thank you for being so faithful with your giving. The ushers will be at the exits with the offering plates. Uh, for a few minutes after service, you can put your welcome cards, your offering in the plate. If you're uh, worshiping online, there's a digital form of the welcome card. And you can also give online through our website, through the app, and you can do text giving. May God bless you as you go out today and through your week.